Welcome to Gears Everything, the podcast ranging in subjects from sex to astrophysics. This time we'll take up uh, improvisation and the value of improvisation. Uh, excuse my voice here. Uh, I've been uh, having a flu for the last uh, week or so, <clears throat> so there will be some uh, some coughing and stuff perhaps during this uh, podcast. Anyway, this is uh, podcast number 17, and uh, I actually covered uh, some of the value of improvisation in my podcast number 15 about public speaking and being a better public speaker even without slides, and that has a lot to do with improvisation. This uh, episode will cover improvisation in role-playing games, so it's basically an RPG role-playing games uh, podcast uh, episode. Now... I'll start off with uh, the point in my life where I realized that improvisation has uh, some tremendous value and that planning does not solve every situation that you can think of. Because the first time I was going to be a game master back in uh, 1982, I was uh, playing Dungeons and Dragons, or rather advanced Dungeons and Dragons at the time, which could be said to be Dungeons and Dragons 2.0. Uh, I was uh, very, very nervous about being a Game Master for the first time. I had some uh, five or six players, each with one character, and they had meticulously crafted their characters uh, and, uh, you know, described their personalities and everything. And and I had been uh, meticulously uh, creating this first adventure. It was a castle that they were going to raid, Uh, going for an adventure and loot and uh, find a magic item in this castle, which was rumored to be uh, inhabited by various creatures. And I draw the castle down to the little minute details. I planned every single thing. I planned for them to go through the front doors, which were planned to be open because a party of orcs had just left the, the castle without closing the doors. And I planned for them to go in uh, through those doors to the right, fight some orcs, then continue down the corridor, uh, find some more orcs and fight them, and then get into an area of the castle which was abandoned, and then fight some zombies and some other undeads until they get to the back of the castle, which was uh, planned to be the great fight against the troll, etc., etc., so all of this was uh, was carefully planned, and I spent a whole weekend, at least 16 hours, uh, drawing the castle and planning the course of the play and everything down to the very, very little details. Now, all of a sudden, um, when the the players started uh, playing this, this adventure of mine, uh, when I said there is an open door in the castle. We played all the way to the castle, and then all of a sudden they they looked at each other and said, well, we walk around the castle. And I, as a game master, I went like, oh, okay, whatever. Uh, And I described the castle as they walked around it. And there is a moat around it, they can easily come over the moat, etc. And then one of the guys asked, so are there any other... Uh, windows or slits or openings uh, on the other side of the castle. And I said, yeah, there there is a window up on the second floor at the back there. Actually, there were several windows. And then one guy said, well, we have this, uh, this rope with a hook on it, and we try to actually cross the moat and stand on a little uh, strip of land, which was grass, right at the bottom of this... Uh, wall in the castle and then we throw the hook up and try to hit the window and we'll climb through the window and I went like oh my god stop it please I couldn't say stop it please because they have their free will and they're supposed to be doing whatever they want to do and I just present the challenges as I plan them but I cannot direct their actions then it would not be a role-playing game so so I went along with this and uh, made it increasingly difficult to to actually hit the, the window. But they rolled a natural 20 on the 20th sided die and they, well, they made the, the throw and they uh, got to climb, which, which I probably overrated as to difficulty, but they still made it. And up through the window they went and into the kitchen where the big troll was standing cooking some 
some food, and the whole plan just went straight out the window. It was totally wrecked. My 16 hours were ruined. And then I realized, you know, whenever you have some free wills in play, you you cannot plan. You cannot plan everything. There is, people will always make some stupid choices or, for that sake, some good choices, and they will ruin your planning thoroughly. I think it was Eisenhower who said, planning is everything, the plan is nothing. So when you have planned, uh, the fact of planning is really good because you prepare yourself for various different situations so you can improvise better. But the fact of the plan, having a plan, is, is worthless when you encounter free wills going at it like you do in a role-playing game. Now, <clears throat> some years later, in 1987, I started a radio show called Midnight Magic. Uh, it was role-playing games on the air and people got to play... Uh, a special uh, role-playing where we didn't have any rules or anything like that, but they were to, uh, to uh, well, uh, beat the challenge within 10 minutes. It could be saving the fair maiden from the clutches of an evil dragon, or it could be some science fiction role-playing, defusing a bomb if you were James Bond, all within 10 minutes. So we had this 10-minute scenarios that were running for each per show. There was two hours of show, and we had some music, and we had the discussions, and we talked about what role-playing games were, and uh, how to play it, and the background story for that specific episode, where each of the four players did the same type of story, but with different challenges. And we were two people in the, in the studio. It was me, and it was my, uh, my co-host, uh, Stein Halvorsen. And we uh, took turn. Uh, we leapfrogged uh, first it was me as a GM then it was him, then it was me, then it was him and different people uh, called in and they were taken in to the studio on the, on the telephone line and we had different uh, things in the studio to make up for you know the, the sound effects we had uh, pencils against uh, bottles to simulate uh, sword fights and we even at a, a certain point in the in the Midnight Magic play, we had an Amiga effect machine into uh, the scene as well. So we had all kinds of technical equipment. We had uh, perhaps the most difficult technical uh, local radio station show in Norway. Now, during our three and a half years of running the show, we ended up as the second most popular local radio station show in Norway, only beaten by Coca-Cola Top 30, which we could never beat. Now, we had some 50,000 listeners every week for this two-hour show and people were like it more than 100 people called in to try to become one of the four players that were making a fool out of themselves on the air trying to beat these challenges where which were often it was completely impossible to beat and they were dying left right and center in various funny situations or you getting stuck or not making the the challenge but sometimes they would it was a crazy fun thing to do. And in the beginning, we were like eight people dis designing this first Midnight Magic uh, episode. And we were sitting there all Sunday for eight or ten hours, uh, crafting and planning everything. And now, my first role-playing game story, where I was the game master and created this, uh, this uh, adventure with the castle... I gave the players free reign, which you should do in a role-playing game. But Midnight Magic, the 10-minute session, was more directed, and there was less uh, chance of the players doing crazy stuff. Some of them did, but there were less chance of doing that. So we thought we could guide the characters more carefully, and therefore the planning would have a better effect. Now, it turned out that they did follow our plan, but it also made the game more robotic and more stifled. The fact that we had planned everything for the characters to do. <clears throat> now, uh, it, it contrasted the later uh, episodes of Midnight Magic. Because as I mentioned, there was three and a half years. And every week, almost, we lead like 150 shows of this. And the listeners told us that the later shows were much, much better than the first shows. 
obviously because we had more experience and we were more relaxed about it. But I got to tell you that contrasting the eight to ten hours of eight people planning the first show with the latest shows or the 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 end run the end shows where Stan and I sat down we had no clue what the role playing game was about to be uh, this for this episode we sat down and told our technician put on a maxi single 7 minutes and during those 7 minutes we actually planned the whole game show the four runs the challenges everything in 7 minutes and we very loosely planned it and then we improvised during the, the the callers when they came in and did their 10 minute challenge we just improvised the hell out of it and it became more lively more uh, zesty more entertaining more fun for us and for the listeners because they reported back and said this was great shows in the beginning it was much more you know uh, limiting because of our planning and also because of our lack of experience obviously but i'm not here to uh, talk up improvising only and talk down planning what i actually uh, aim to do in my uh, role playing games when i'm a, a game master i i i tend to do the balance i find it that i'm the best when i plan a lot I do the, the crafting of the non-playing characters, the, the description of their uh, personalities. I dream about this. I lie in the bed at night. I try to figure it out. I, I almost talking to myself in my head about how this character should become, how they work, what is their background story, what do they like, what do they not like, what do they hate, what do they love. All of this, I, I go into the non-playing characters and I plan them a lot. And I also plan encounters. I plan the situation, somebody has tilted a cart on the bridge and it's all for fake because somebody is going to help them and then somebody comes out underneath from the, the bridge and, and uh, you know ambush the player characters and rob them to the hilt. All of this, I, I plan a lot of these encounters, but I don't plan the sequence. I don't plan first they do this, then they do that, then that. No, I use it as Lego pieces. I have a lot of encounters. And then I throw my dice and figure out what is happening based on some tables, etc. So I use the game system. But when I get to, to some uh, place in the game system where it says, uh, you know, G GM's choice. We have some tables in our game system, Amar, where it says GM's choice. Then I pull out of the hat some of these or one of these encounters that I have pre-made before, that I have meticulously planned, uh, and then I throw that encounter into it, just like a Lego piece. I put the Lego piece in there. Um, and also in dungeon, if, I, if, I, if there is a castle or a dungeon or some type of adventure, I tend to not plan the sequence too closely. Having my first game mastering experience fresh in mind, I tend to just put Lego pieces in there which in itself could be well planned, or maybe not, but then it works better with the play. Because if you only improvise, if you just, uh, if you don't plan anything and you just go completely by your imagination at the spur of the moment, and if the players understand that and they get that you're just improvising as a game master, the game can turn into how to influence the game master to make his improvisation benefit my character. If, you, if they don't know if it's a plan or if you're improvising, then it's a lot better because then the game becomes more lively and the game does not become completely focused on how to influence the game master. You let the game play be a mixture of improvising, of planning and of the game system itself. If you get, that, that, get to that spot where there is a, you know, a third, a third, a third, of the game system, of the planning, and of the improvising. I think that's the place to be. That is the soft, the, the sweet spot where the the role-playing game come to the fore and where you really get the live and fun role-playing. Obviously, you have to get the right players in, in there uh, because if you get some bad apples or players, it can ruin the whole experience for everybody. Now, that's uh, something I have to talk to uh, talk to you about in the in the next uh, or some later 
uh, episode of this podcast. But for now, it's it's a good thing to learn to improvise uh, and you become better at what you do a lot, which my good friend Ulevik says. Now, if you teach yourself to improvise, you become better at improvising. If you, if you do more planning, you become better at planning. If you learn the game system and play with the game system, you get better at doing that but both uh, or all of these three are important to make a fun and live lively game now it's also become easier for me to improvise as i uh, did more programming on the amar tools you will find the amar tools on my isna.org website over at the right uh, menu uh, right side of the of the screen there's a menu and the mar tools is one of them and in the mar tools um, you can use this even if you're not playing the mar role playing game system you can still use them to to create not playing uh, characters you can uh, use them to create encounters you can use them to create towns or cities or villages with um, how people are reacting towards each other. The whole relationship map of a whole town can easily be created uh, in one uh, click. So with these tools, it makes it much more easy to improvise. But still, I do this uh, planning uh, on beforehand to create some really detailed, interesting, intricate, non-playing characters and encounters that juices up or spices up the game. So I hope this uh, this podcast can help you balance between improvising, the planning, and the game system itself. And if you want me to talk about more stuff in uh, role-playing games, I can easily do that. I have uh, more than 35 years of experience in, in game mastering various uh, systems. And nowadays I'm also getting back into Paranoia, the sci-fi role-playing game where I will be a game master for the first time in Paranoia. I used to be a player with an excellent game master, Andreas Dahl, back in 1987, 88, I think. And now, 30 years later, I'm getting back to the game. It's a new edition of Paranoia, and I will do a review of that game later. But first, I will have to do this game mastering of, uh, of Paranoia first and see how it runs. I remember it as a really fascinating, fun game. But that will be later. So that's it for now. Thank you for listening and take care and have a great 2019, by the way.